Okay. Hi. I'm Leonard Pattering, and I'm actually going to do a talk that is touches probably a lot of topics that the talk immediately preceding mine actually already covered. But I'm going to do my talk from a system upstream perspective, of course. Um, my talk is called Portable Services Are Ready to Use. Um, I have given a talk about portable services before, but uh, uh, in uh, other conferences like the one in uh, DEF CONF, ZZ in Czech Republic. But at that point, I mostly talked about the concepts uh, without there actually being any real code around. Um, now I'm talking from the perspective where all what I promised back then is actually implemented and available in the uh, most recent systemd release. Um, yeah, so what am I actually going to talk about? Let's. Uh, um, answer that question, what are actually portable services? Um, you could, one possible answer to that is that they are system services, like the classic thing that system manages, with some container features applied. You can also see it the other way around, they're containers with uh, some features uh, that the classic system services have. Um, containers in this regard, like, I mean, nobody knows what containers really are, but usually people settle on the three um, concept resource bundling, isolation, and delivery. Um, for portable services, um, I'm uh, not interested in all of them. I don't care about delivery, but I do care about um, resource bundling, and I do care about sandboxing at least, which is similar to isolation, but a different word, and I pick a different word there for a reason, because uh, sandboxing, at least in my uh, vocabulary, is a little bit weaker than the isolation, because it's not about creating separate worlds, it's just about uh, making sure um, that while you live in the same world, you uh, um, cannot do everything uh, that um, you traditionally could do from a system service. Um, portable servers are supposed to be um, very, very modular, and yeah, um, modular in, rega in, in regards to that you can actually pick of uh, these concepts what you precisely want. Like you can actually use portable servers without sandboxing, or you can use um, just the sandboxing concept of portable services. So it's not this um, this buy-in that you have to make when you do classic containers, because in classic containers you kind of have to opt in to, into everything. And then there are ways how you can opt out of some bits, but it's not really um, healthy if you do. Anyway, if you consider range from integration to isolation, right, then uh, you could, uh, I mean, ideally I would have uh, drawn this properly with a graphics program, but I'm very, very lazy, so I just uh, did that with LaTeX here. So if you uh, consider a, a range from classic system service on the left hand, very integrated to this operating system, right, it runs with full privileges, sees the entire rest of, of the operating system, um, and on the right hand, like on the greatest isolation, you think about VMs, like KVM, right, like where they have the largest level of isolation from the host. You basically never talk to the host directly, only through um, networking, so you pretend you're actually a completely different system, right? Then um, containers, classic containers, Docker-style uh, microservices, are somewhere in the middle, right? They are more integrated than VMs, because they tend to use the networking stack of the host, but they're also more isolated than system services, because they traditionally uh, cannot see the process list of the host, and they cannot um, get access to the entire file system host, and so on. Um, so yeah, if you, if you have this coordinate system where on the left, classic system servers, on the right, uh, full uh, VM virtualization, somewhere in the middle, they have Docker-style um, microservices, then I would say portable system services somewhere between um, the isolation um, uh, position of classic system services and Docker-style microservices. So you get a lot of integration into the host system, um, more than you would uh, get um, if you would run Docker, but you would also get um, more separation from the rest of the system um, than you would get if you would actually run a system service. So uh, um, specifically, what I actually mean with integration isolation, I mean different things. Um, that can be integrated or isolated from the rest of the system, like it could be networking, obvious candidate, file system, all basically everything that's not a classic system service tends to have isolated file system, right? They have their own file system tree in general. Um, uh, uh, PID namespaces, right? Like if you see the process tree of the host or if you live in your own one, um, the, whether it has, has access to the init system, if it has its own init system or shares the init system with the host. It's about device access, right? Like in a VM, you totally do not uh, usually have access to physical devices of the host. In containers, it's somewhat messy. Some people do that. Um, while a system service generally has full access to the local hardware if it wants to because it sees the same slash dev and gets all the device management. Um, and logging is uh, also a con. Right, like so. Um, 
yeah, depending on what you focus on, um, integration might be good, might be bad. Like you, sometimes you want uh, networking isolated, sometimes you want um, networking integrated. Anyway, I'm kind of trying to um, get the message across that this portable services is neither containers, it's neither the classic system service, somewhere in the middle, um, and is relatively large level of integration with the rest. Portable service have a couple of goals, like implementation-wise, right? Like, so, um, you know, when you do service management, like the system developers have been doing for a while, um, then you realize that the way how on classic operating systems, like on RHEL and all the um, Linuxes, when you install a system service, like, like Apache or Nginx or MySQL, or whatever, um, then, uh, and you remove it again, you leave a lot of artifacts, right? For example, um, system users. Right? On Unix, it's generally there's no concept of uh, safely removing Unix users, at least traditionally. Um, so this basically means if you install an RPM, if you install a, a .dep that requires a system user, it will create it during installation time and it will never be removed, regardless if you remove the RPM or the .dep. The reason for that is sticky file ownership. Right? If there is one file that was owned by the MySQL user, right, and you remove the MySQL user, then it will continue to be owned by its UID, um, and then if you assign the same UIDs to a different user later on, then we'll suddenly get access to files that probably shouldn't get access to, right? Um, because of that, all the distributions generally do not remove users. So that's what I call an artifact. Um, you drop a service in, you take it out again, and the system has been modified. It's not back at the state where it comes from. And there are a couple of other places where this um, matters, right? Like there can be files in slash run and all over the place because in classic system services, um, they have access to basically everything, right? And there is no way how you can be sure that when an RPM is removed, it really doesn't leave files around. So with um, the portable service context, I, I try to focus on classic system service management, but fix that facet, right? So I wanted a scheme where you can operate very similar to system services, but there's a guarantee that no artifacts remain in the system when you remove the portable service again. This effectively means binding life cycles together, right? For example, um, think about slash temp, right? M many, many demons tend to write files into slash temp. These files are generally owned, owned by the user ID of that service. If the service goes away, they remain there, and then somebody else can get access to it. By binding life cycles, I mean that um, if we now declare that the service, when it is started, has its own private little subdirectory of slash temp, and when the service goes down, we remove it, then we have bound the life cycles of these temporary files to the service itself. We know when the service is gone, the temporary files are gone too, and the temporary files will only exist at most until the point where the service goes down. This kind of life cycle binding we can actually do for a lot of other stuff as well, right? Like for example, um, something that we'll talk about later in, the, in this talk is um, in, with this approach that I've followed here, we suddenly get a concept of, of ephemeral user IDs. Like we'll break up the classic static user ID um, concept, right, where we have static users, the problem that I explained earlier, um, but you can actually have some ephemeral, let the user appear and later go away in a safe way, and that also is again, yeah, leave no artifacts. Um, another goal is everything in one place, right? Like this is a classic problem, at least I personally see with RPM and Debian-based distributions, is um, the general concept is to distribute the files that are in the RPM basically over the entire file system, right? Stuff ends up in slash user, and stuff ends up in slash var, stuff ends up in Etsy. Um, there is some tracking usually in these package managers to figure out what belongs to what, but it's very much inc incomplete because it basically generally only lists the stuff that, that the package manager actually thought about, the guy who put the package together, not the stuff that is actually written out um, during runtime. So uh, what containers generally do better in this area is they actually put everything in one place, right? So they know that if they remove that place, then all the data is gone too. By the way, if you have any questions, totally go and interrupt me right away. Um, that's way better than if we just do the question and answer session at the end. So, uh, yeah. Anybody question at this point? Nope. Okay. Um, another goal that I wanted to implement with portable service, I wanted something that feels very close to native service, right? I wanted it so close that it actually is one. This is different from containers, right? Like if you do container management, like microservice management, you usually live in completely different worlds, right? You have the service management on the host, and you have the container managers, and uh, they have different tools to interact with them, different semantics, different uh, like runtime cycles, different um, ways how you configure resources, different ways how you basically do everything, right? I figured that um, for many use cases, it's more interesting to just consider the container stuff or like the 
stuff that's clo closer to classic container management, more like a regular system service, and have the same APIs to manage it all. So one of my goals was I wanted the feel, like the user interaction, the user concept should be for these portable services exactly like native services. So the mean system control should work for them like for any other native service. This, these were the goals. Now the question um, one always has to ask, what's the use cases? Why do we even do this? Um, for me, it's a kind of the next step for service management. I mean, that's what systemd is. It's a service manager. And uh, we don't live in a vacuum, so we look around what other people do. And uh, container management um, is kind of the hot thing, or at least, at least was the hot thing t uh, one year ago. Um, so there are stuff we can learn from that. I think uh, service ma like, like container management, I mean, there are very good reasons why people use this. And I think many of these reasons why people use them um, are also relevant for service management itself, e.e. the classic um, way how people um, deployed stuff on Unix. Um, what's also interesting to notice is, um, you know, everything that we ship on the various distributions that have adopted systemd these days, which are eff effectively every single one of them, already has a systemd service file, right? So um, this is something really interesting, right? Like it basically means that if we um, add these container features to classic service management, then we can basically relatively for free um, uh, have these, this bundling, have the better isolation um, without actually introducing any new metadata, without actually requiring to people to come up with completely new, new ways and concepts how to manage all this stuff. Um, also, I think uh, admins are used to, the serv to service management already. Right? Most people do know what a system service is and know how to interact with it and explore it. So it's kind of nice to just add this little step ahead to make some of the container stuff available so that they can yeah, know already how it works. Um, one main use case of um, what I want to do with the uh, pro uh, portable containers is something that's often called super privileged containers. This is um, like uh, um, at, at Red Hat, for example, we have lots of storage people and they want to be able to ship as a container stuff that very closely interacts with the hardware of the local system because it does um, storage, right? So they want to have the bundling, but they also want a huge amount of integration into the host system, right? They want to interact with the kernel very closely, with the device management very closely, and all these kind of stuff. Um, they hence came up with this uh, concept of super privileged containers, which is basically Docker, but with all the security turned off. To me, that sounds like, yeah, taking a tool and turning it into something that it really isn't. I think um, with the portable containers, uh, with the portable services, um, this use case is much better um, dealt with because, yeah, you ultimately actually do get a regular um, system service, just a, a system service that you can ship in a nicer form than necessarily an RPM because you get the bundling. So, um, in many cases, also the integration, I mean, this is like the effect of the super privileged container stuff. In many cases, integrating the this, um, stuff that you want to run into the host is a good thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. That's not for all the cases, right? Um, but frequently, you do want to have access to the host system's features um, and the information that the host system has and the other stuff that runs on the, the host. You don't always want the isolation. Um, so um, I hope this gives a bit of an idea what, what, we ha what I have in mind with this and why I think this makes some sense as a generic tool. It doesn't mean that this is something that's supposed to contain, uh, replace containers or anything. I totally have no interest in that. It's just... Um, I think there is reason to add something between classic service management and container management, and for many use cases, it's probably the better option than either of those two. Um, the ultimate effect of this is that from the systemd perspective, you could say um, previously systemd supported two um, service formats, the native systemd one and the classic system5 one. Now it supports three, system5, the native one, and these new portable service, the services. Um, actually, many of the concepts um, that portable services are implemented with are so generic that you could even support others um, in a similar way um, without um, really completely inventing the, 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 the wheel new and without even patching around in systemd because what's really key about the portable service stuff that I've done here is it doesn't add anything new to the systemd core. It's just a set of generators, ultimately, and a little extra daemon to make things easy um, that takes all the stuff already implemented in systemd anyway and packages up in a nicer, fancier way so that it's a little bit nicer to use, right? So um, 
this is actually key, right? Like all the portable services stuff is not a completely new um, addition. It's not that the P PID one would have an understanding of portable services. It doesn't. It just means that all the stuff that's already implemented, we open up in a new way to make it a little bit more user friendly. What are portable services in in practice? By the way, any further questions at this point? No questions yet. Okay. Um, so what actually are portable services? Um, ultimately, they're disk images, right? A disk image. Um, uh, like, I mean, all the container managers do that, right? Like, for example, Docker tends to have these series of TARF balls um, that is their disk image. Um, with these portable services, um, I had this one goal. I didn't want to introduce any new bad metadata. So for portable services, a disk image is whatever you want a disk image to be. Specifically meaning, I avoid defining something new. Instead, you can just say a portable service is some plain directory tree. It can also be a part of a subvolume if you're um, a Facebook guy. Um, but it, uh, it can also mean a GPT partition image or something. It can be anything, basically, that the Linux kernel can read directly. Um, so anything that you can mount or anything that is already mounted and then you can access through the file system layer. Um, if you have these um, images, um, what portable services are, are basically that you take the images that are on them, uh, the services that are on them, and integrate them on the, into the host system through root image and root directory. For those who don't have experience with these two options, these two options are, um, have existed for a longer time in systemd. Root image, um, you can use it in a service file, and uh, then you can specify a raw disk image there. And uh, if you do, then uh, everything that the service file defines gets, is actually relative to the top-level directory into that, in that image. Similar root directory is exactly what true root is, right? You specify a directory there, and then everything you specify in the service file is relative to that, right? Um, what portable servers now are, are basically just making use of this in a friendlier way. So a disk image that contains services can be considered a portable service. Um, and then this basically means services that are contained in it are pulled out and run from directly that image through root image and root directory. So it's ultimately, um, I mean, you could say that portable servers don't bring anything new to the table, neither on the system side, like because all the concepts were there, nor even on the philosophical si sides, because ultimately portable servers are just a fancier truth. Um, what's, by the way, nice to, manage, uh, to mention is that the root image uh, option that has existed for a while is kind of nice because it also does cryptography and does Verity. So Verity, for those who don't know, is like uh, this um, authentication, like cryptographic authentication of images so that you can actually uh, ship an image to a system um, and uh, then while um, the system runs that image, all accesses are cryptographically verified to guarantee that that image is still in the version that the vendor shipped it in originally. This is an this is amazing concept, actually, because it allows you to um, make guarantees that the image that you deploy is really the image that is being run and that it cannot be modified in the middle. But um, uh, this is something that Docker or all these systems cannot deliver, right? Like Because this is like open the door for cryptographically secure data centers. But yeah, I'm not going to talk too much about that. So as mentioned, a uh, disk image that is, can be considered a portable service is in no way anything new. It can be just a regular directory or a raw disk image. What matters, though, is that there are systemd unit files in there. right? In user lib systemd or something, you have, a, you have to have at least one unit file. What also matters is that it carries a US, uh, user lib OS release file. Um, for those who don't know, all your distributions do that by default. This OS release file just says on Debian it's a Debian, on Fedora it's a Fedora. So um, these requirements we only make, like the, the, the service one actually matters, but the OS release one we only make so that um, there's a little bit of extra verification that uh, portable services, you, you knew what you were doing when putting together the portable service by creating that file. Um, so this is about the bundling, right? Like, you, I hope you got the idea that uh, um, when you have a portable service, pretty much any operating system that you have is already a portable service, right? The other thing is sandboxing. I mentioned this already that I am not using the term um, isolation, I'm using the term um, sandboxing. The sandboxing functionality in portable services is nothing new. Again, it is functionality that has been in system before a longer time. Like, the, all these options are basically sandboxing options that you can already use with classic system services already, right? Um, I don't really want to go into the details with what all of these do. Um, 
uh, except maybe one here, for example, private TMP, is something that gives you private slash temp so that you get the lifecycle bounding and you can be sure that all these um, uh, access, like these attacks through uh, um, improper slash temp temporary file management just go away. Anyway, these are all sandboxing options um, that have been existing in systemd for a while. What portable services does, it makes them easier to use um, in a one-stop solution, basically. And we're working on more, actually. So uh, there are going to be even more sandboxing options. Um, um, there's also per service firewalling, which is also interesting because it's a service, uh, interesting because it's a service, uh, like a service a sandboxing concept in a way. Um, now, I'm, as mentioned, all of these sandboxing options have existed for a while already, so there's nothing new about it. What is new about the portable services stuff in this regard, though, is um, if you use portable services, all these sandboxing options are turned on by default, right? This is something, ideally, we would do that for regular system services, too. The thing is, though, we can't do this for compatibility reasons, because System 5 services, like all the heritage that we have and the initial versions of SystemD, don't do this kind of sandboxing. So if you, for example, would start to taking away write access for all your system services by default, then things will break everywhere because services are not ready for that, right? So um, this is the reason why um, in SystemD, unfortunately, for regular system services, all the sandboxing is opt-in, not opt-out. For the portable surf, we turn that around, so it's opt-out, not opt-in. For classic containers, of course, it's also opt-out, not opt-in, the way it should be. Um, now, let's say you have um, an image file and it contains a service and you decide this is a portable service now. Then, and then you want to run this on a specific host, then you have a couple of problems. One of them, and this can be quite hard, is dynamic users. Um, like, I mean, dynamic users actually a solution to this problem. The problem is basically what I mentioned earlier. If you install an RPM on a system um, for Apache or something, it creates a user for you, a static user, it's HTTPD or something. Um, so RPMs do that. Um, if you now want to centralize everything in one image, um, then you want this not to work that way. You want it so that this user is created, but the moment you drop that image again, you, the moment you stop the services from that image, the user should go away. Our solution to that problem, problem is dynamic users. Dynamic users, I personally think it's like, it's, it's a big step ahead for, for the entire Unix concept, because, like, I mean, the user ID concept in Unix is the quintessential security mechanism that we ever had. Right? I mean, people have added capabilities and SLinux and all these kind of things. They have added uh, namespaces, read-only mounts, and all that stuff. But at the very core, the one security concept that all Unix has always had was the user ID. Right? Um, there are operating systems which recognize that. For example, in Android, like on all your phones, all the apps run individually gets one uh, UID assigned because they realize if they want to isolate these, these um, user apps from each other, then the best way to do it is by just using that quintessential security concept that Unix ever had. Um, on classic Unix distributions, because these users are so static, there's only very limited use of it, right? Um, for example, if you run Apache, it, will only register one user ID and will run everything on it, even though it would be much better if, for example, every vhost would have its own user ID so that if somebody exploits one website, you don't get access to the other websites as well, right? So on classic Unix, um, user ID is ex expensive, right? They are static, they stick around, so um, you cannot just allocate one and then use it. You have to think many times if you want to do this because you know they're going to stick for around forever on the system um, and there are not that many around anyway because you only have 1,000 usually on, on current Linuxes because they have to have user ID on that 1,000. So our solution to this problem is dynamic users. Dynamic users um, try to break this up. It's an attempt to make user ID allocation cheap and ephemeral, right? So that you can basically say a user is allocated the moment the service is started and is deallocated the moment the service goes down. Right? This, I mentioned this earlier, there's a sticky file problem with that. Right? Like if that service would create a file while it is running, then, be, then terminate and the file would stick around, then, uh, and then some time later the UID would be used for a different dynamic user, it could act, get access to stuff it shouldn't get access to. Our uh, solution is this, if you turn on dynamic users for a specific service, then also you automatically get added to a sandbox that takes away any write access to anywhere in the file system except for very few 
closely life-cycled places, right? Um, so dynamic users doesn't, like, the way system D implements it, it's not going to add just dynamic users. It always implies also getting a complete sandbox so that the sticky file problem goes away by simply not allowing you to write any files anywhere and only giving you basically write access to slash temp where we can lifecycle bound it, a runtime directory where we can make sure that it's properly isolated in a couple of other places. Um, yeah, this, is, this was a hard problem to solve, and I personally think, like, I mean, the dynamic user stuff is useful for the portable services stuff, because it allows us to put together portable services that use system users, and we know that when the portable service goes away, the user also goes away, but they're also general user for all other cases, right? Like, ignore portable services, dynamic users are awesome, right? Because you can, for example, with systemd run, you can create, like, a, a transient service that only exists as long as you want like dynamically on the command line and in that you can allocate a dynamic user and then that command is run dynamically on a user ID that goes away when that command finished. So dynamic users are a big step ahead I think and particularly to to breathe new life into this concept of Unix user IDs that I in my opinion at least has languished for a long time on classic um, Unix systems. Another problem is uh, very closely related to this. If you work with root systems traditionally, you have this problem with the user database mismatch. Um, what do I mean with, the, with that? Um, if you, like Etsy PassWD, if you ship that in a root, there's a very good chance that it's going to be different from Etsy PassWD that is actually on the host, right? This basically means that if you do PS in that root environment or in any kind of uh, environment that shares the, the process tree with the host, um, then you will see that all the user IDs might be not resolved to the right names and vice versa, right? Um, this is a problem, right? There's a problem for any root environment. Uh, if we want to do portable services, right, we want to have this ability that you can bundle up a couple of things in a directory tree and then run the services from that tree on the host, then you have to deal with that problem. What do you do with the mismatched um, user database? The solution um, we came up with um, is called uh, uh, private users. If you turn that on for a service and it's automatically done um, if you use the portable services stuff, um, then it basically means that using uh, the username spacing concept in the Linux kernel, um, from the view of the portable service, all user IDs that are viable on the host are mapped to the nobody user, except for the root user, which is mapped to the root user, and the dynamic user that was allocated for the service itself. Right? So, the effect of this is basically that from the perspective of the portable service, there will only be three users in the entire system visible, right? There will only be processes visible that are owned either by root, by nobody, or by himself, right? And there will, everything else will just disappear through the mapping of the username spacing. Um, this is actually really interesting. Like, I mean, user namespaces are like a kernel feature that I have certain problems with. I think they're um, extremely over-designed. But it's a really interesting use case for this, um, where, where we can make this, this mapping that user namespacing, like Linux kernel user namespacing allows, us to reduce the, the, the differences between the Etsy passw stuff by simply ignoring everything in it, because we know and they're never going to be these other users because we move them entirely out of view. I hope this was in any way something you could follow. I know it's, uh, yeah, user namespaces are a topic for itself. I don't want to go too much detail about how messy this all is. But um, anyway, it, it, this takes benefit of the fact that on Unix, across all distributions, um, everybody agrees on the definition of at least two users, right? Everybody agrees that the root user is called root and has user ID 0, and everybody agrees that there is a nobody user, which has user ID 6553, what, um, uh, right, uh, minus 2. Um, and uh, even though people can't necessarily um, agree what the right name for it is, because Fedora for some reason calls it NFS nobody instead of nobody. But anyway, the, they do at least agree that there is this user, even if they don't agree on the name of it. So, yeah. So that is the solution to this. There are a couple of other hard problems. The DBus one is not um, solved yet, right? Like if you do a system service and you want to access the rest of the system, the most popular IPC system on Linux is DBus, right? DBus is, um, it expects 
um, static policy written in XML stuff installed onto the system for for clients to be able to do something. This is an unsolved problem. We ha have talked to various people involved in Divas about what we can do there, but it's still a bit unsolved. Um, a couple of things. How much time do I have? Um, a couple of things that are in scope for the entire concept of portable services is simple delivery. But simple delivery, meaning that, um, yeah, I kind of want to make easy that you can use the built-in system, the tools to download something from HTTP server, but that's kind of the level where it is. In scope for portable services verification, I kind of mentioned this already with the Verity stuff, right? I want a, a strong cryptographic verification to a level um, where none of the classic container management uh, solutions uh, provide this. There's simple building and versioning socket activation. I mean, it's just about like people ask me what what is portable service about i kind of the message that i want to get across about this is really um portable service is supposed to be like a basic building block that your operating system like another basic building block that the op basic operating system offers you but it's a basic building block right like it's not a solution that you can actually fully deploy because it's not comprehensive it does not um help you to to um do um like load distribution migration like the orchestration stuff it just um does really the low level bits um but in a nice concept um i talked a lot about what portable services are and i do hope that at least some of you got a basic idea what i want to do with this right like that i want to take system services add this uh, these bundle concept to it yeah, through to roots, through these um, root directory and root image um, settings and systemd, and that I want to do uh, put a strong emphasis on sandboxing. Now, how does it actually look like if you work with it? What's the mode of operation? Um, yeah, so if you run uh, uh, the newest systemd version, you'll find this new tool um, uh, installed. It's called Portable Control. Right, it follows the same scheme how everything in systemd that you interface with suffixes with uh, control, and uh, yeah. So in this case, this is just an example. Let's say you have a portable um, service image, and it's called fubar.raw. It has a suffix raw because it's a raw disk image, right? It doesn't really matter what suffix you give it, right? Um, let's say it has an XT4 image in there, and there's an operating system in there, and has a couple of services. If you issue portable control attach fubar.raw, what happens is that this tool will look into the image, look for the service files supplied in that image, um, pick some of them. Um, we'll come to which one that we'll pick. Um, copies them into at systemd system, right? The stuff where you put your own uh, unit files into, extends the unit files with a root directory or a root image. In this case, root image because we are working with a with a raw disk image here, and that's already it, right? So what does it do? It copies out the unit files, makes sure that the when the unit files are actually executed, points back to the disk image we're working with, and that's it, right? So if you run this, then suddenly the services from that um, uh, image file are available on the host like any other system service. You can start it, you can stop it, you can do status with it, you can do resource manage with it, you can enable it at boot, you can do whatever you like with it. There's another command which does the opposite, calls detach foobar. Uh, like it's part of control detach. If you invoke it on the same image, it does a reverse. It just looks for the for these unit files that got copied out, removes them again. There you go. Now everything's gone, right? Like because all the data was um, was uh, um, centralized in that image, and because uh, we use like this in the background, uses all the fancy stuff that I was just talked about about the dynamic users and the sandboxing things like that. We know that after the detach, there's nothing remaining in the system from that image, with one exception, by the way, which is logging. Right, like any logging that these system services did um, that ran from this between the attach and detach, right? I mean, just running this after the other will not run any services because it just make them available in the system and then make them unavailable again. You in between have to actually run system control start or something to actually start something, right? You, I hope you get the idea. But anyway, everything that might have logged will remain on the system, right? Like logging is something we do consider um, an artifact that should remain and should not be kicked, uh, removed. There is a question, should we do this with the microphone or should, just, should I just repeat? Over there. Is there a non-interactive operation mode where you can pre-deploy an image and just first boot into it? Um, uh, so uh, 
there, I mean, this is non-interactive, right? I mean, you can do that from any script, but uh, if you want like a directory where you just drop the stuff in, um, no, we don't have that. But it makes a lot of sense to add. Um, this stuff, what it internally does, I mean, Portable Control is a dumb tool that just talks to a little mini daemon through dbus. Um, so if you want to attach images to something, you can just go through dbus. What is important, though, is we can do Portable Control attach foobar.raw, right? That makes the services available to the host. And then you can do Portable Control enable foobar, which does exactly what it would do for a normal service, like hook it into the boot process, so at next boot, it will automatically be started, right? So the idea really is that um, uh, after the attaching, it really is part of the, of the system, so you don't need any particular special preparation to boot it on the next time, you just use the regular tools, just system control enabled. That's kind of the key of the idea, really, that it's, it's not different from the, from the normal stuff. Uh, what happens if uh, the name of the service inside this uh, image conflicts with someone, one already on the system or an older version of this image? Okay, that's a very good question. So this is the stuff that I omitted earlier. Like um, I, I said that some of the unit files included in that image are copied out. Um, to go into the detail with that, um, what it does by default is it derives the names of the unit files um, that it copies out from the name of the image itself. So in this case, what it actually does, it copies out anything that is either called foobar.service or is called foobar-anything.service. Or either of the above, but with target, timer, socket, or path at the end, right? So the idea is that this makes it possible um, to ship multiple services, plus timers, plus paths, plus targets, whatever you like, in a single image, right? As long as you give them the same prefix name that happens to have the same name as the image itself, um, that's what gets copied out. Right? That said, that's only the default. On the command line, you can actually specify that you want to copy out anything you like. Right? Um, the tool will, by default, um, before it copies it, it will validate it for you and will help you and tell you, oh my god, you already have that installed on the host. Are you sure you want to do this? Actually, currently, it doesn't allow you to override it even, I think. But um, yeah, it will notice um, when there are conflicts and not allow this for you. But the, uh, the idea basically is that if you have your app, you want to ship it like this, you just adopt the scheme where you give all the unit files of your app the same prefix. Like my suggestion would even be use reverse domain implementation, right? Give the image file itself um, also the same um, reverse domain name notation. And then you just can do attach and detach. You, you can be reasonably sure that there are not going to be conflicts in naming. And the units file can run as normal system service. They can be run through portable service. It doesn't really matter. Um, I can extend the with drop-ins from the main system, right? Yes, okay. because um, they are installed into the main system, right? They, 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 they are really the real thing, right? Like you can do system control cat, you can see them, you can do system control edit, um, you can do system control set property. They are native ser services at that point, right? They just happen to already have one um, extension, which is the root directory root image thing. Plus, um, the way it actually works is that um, they ha we have these profiles here, uh, these ones. This is about the sandboxing thing. So what, if you do the enable, it will actually do more than just add the root image in the root directory. What it also does, it links, like some links, into the um, .d directory for extending the unit files. It also links another one, which, is, which we call the profile, which just links uh, the, the sandboxing options to turn on. Um, by default, it um, uses one profile that is called um, default. It's, uh, it locks the system very, like locks services down very much. Right, so they run at very little privileges. Pretty much everything that I had on that other slide was the sandboxing options and turned on in the way. We do have a couple of other profiles, though. If you pick strict, um, uh, then this is uh, even stricter, right? And then there's trusted, which is the opposite. And if you use trusted, basically there are no sandboxing options at all. Turn on and um, no network is uh, the same actually as default, except that it's without networking. Um, you can define your own profiles. These are just the default, uh, default profiles that we ship. And as mentioned, the one that calls default is actually the one if you don't specify anything. If you actually use these commands that I suggested here, that's what you get, right? So the idea is, yes, by default sandbox, by default you have security, but if you don't want to, you specify the trusted thing and there you go. It's gone. Yep. And is it planned to be integrated into the package manager or are they supposed to be a thing of their own? There's this thing on your own, like it's supposed about bundles that you build whatever you like. 
Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, you can use RPM and DPKG to build your images, but that's up to you. I don't care. This is, this is on top of this, right? Um, let's do one last thing. Um, what's really key here is I don't d define any new metadata with this, right? There is no new disk format because the disk format is basically directory tree or a raw disk image which is like what every, all the tools can generate anyway, all the tools can read anyway, what the Linux kernel can read. Similar, there is no new format for defining what to actually run in that, because it's just plain unit files, right? It's, it's, it's just the stuff that we have anyway. Um, there is new, no new metadata about the image itself, because it's just user lib OS release, the stuff that already exists. So this is a key point to take away here. It's not a new format. It just uses stuff we already have just makes it a little bit nicer to use so that you can kind of merge the, these images with the host system in a safe and somewhat nice way to, uh, yeah. Um, and I think I already mentioned this, so I'm uh, basically done. One last thing, because it is requires, uh, no, it has no um, like new metadata, there is actually no real need to use any specific tool to build these. You can build these images with any tool you like, it can be, for example, the bootstrap. It can be a yum root install or whatever it's called. Um, I wrote one tool, which is MKOSI. It's a little bit nicer to use than the other ones, but it's, it's, it's a useless script in many ways because it's just a wrapper around the bootstrap and the other ones. Um, so use it if you like, uh, but you totally don't have to. You can even build images that are compatible with portable services with, with uh, like, I don't know, tools that I typically use for building VM images. Because if you have a building in a raw VM image, you can, it can also double as a portable service uh, image because it can, like, there's nothing special about this stuff. If it's something that Linux can access, it's a portable service image, as long as it ca carries at least a unit file and, a, and the OS release file. So this is really the key, um, like, I'm not going to give you many build tools, I mean, this one, yes, but um, you can use any like Vagrant or whatever you have to build these images. It's completely up to you because I don't introduce anything new. There is no JSON stuff or XML stuff or whatever else um, that you now have to write out because your images are already compatible. That's actually an interesting property because you can have one image that can act as a VM image, right? Um, and you can boot up and then there's a system inside and boots up the service and everything's good. You can build uh, that image so that it also can be run in end spawn, which is uh, basically for free. I mean, it's a simpler approach because you don't need a bootloader, but you can um, take benefit of system in, in, in there. But you can also attach it as a, um, you can also attach it as a portable service, um, and in that case, integrate it with the rest of the system. So um, that's all I have. Thank you very much for your interest. Um, if you have any further questions, meet them in the hallway track. Um, in particular, I would like to talk to all those people like you who did the talk right before because I was super close to what I was talking about. I hope this was interesting to you and uh, I need to vacate the stage. Thank you very much.